Hello everybody, in this lecture we will uh, move on with Franken's domain analysis for feedback control systems and learn stability margins or gain and phase margins for uh, closed uh, feedback systems. Okay, so before going to Franken's domain analysis, let's remember uh, how we define relative stability based on pole locations and root locks. Okay, so first of all, we know that for a statement to be stable, none of the poles, closed poles, should be in the open right of plane. Okay, so if you are here, then you are stable. If there is a pole in this location or image uh, axis, it is by bone stable. Okay, so this is fine for uh, discrete stability, but we know that subsystems perform better based on the pole locations. Okay, so first of all, let's assume it's a first order system and we have a pole here. Okay, and associated with, the pole, with this pole, we have a setting time or other uh, performance metrics, basically setting time. If I move this pole, in this direction, for example, to a point here. Okay, what happens? We know that setting time will decrease in this direction, which means that the system will become faster and the system will be, in terms of closed performance, more stable. Okay, so this is one way of looking at the stability. Let's assume that we have a second order system in the second case and we have pole locations located here. Okay, they are complex range good. And let's assume that without changing the distance to the origin, we change the angle with respect to the uh, real axis and move uh, poles to two different locations which are closer to the real axis. Okay, but we know that these distances are equal. So what happens in this case? We know that the maximum overshoot decreases frequency of oscillations decreases and overshoot is bad and we don't want like uh, frequency of oscillations to be very high in this sense the system will be more stable okay so these are like good all locations and relative like stability with respect to two, uh, transfer function or two systems okay so in that uh, if you summary if we move in this direction and in this direction so one is like Toward the real, uh, negative uh, infinity, and on the major x, if we move towards the uh, origin, the system will perform better, will be more stable. Okay, now we will talk about uh, Freitin's domain stability matrix, but let's remember our assumptions. Okay, we first assume that in this uh, part of the course, GLS, the open transfer function of the system, is a minimum phase system. Okay, in this case, we claim that, or we like, uh, express that there shouldn't be any pole or zero in the open right of plane. Okay, there shouldn't be any unstable pole or zero that may cause uh, instability in the like feedback loop. Okay, we also require this, which is very common, which simply says that the system should be causal. This is new. The feedback system should be type zero, one, or two. So triple integrity is kind of not allowed, and polar plot of GOF. Geomega crosses the negative real axis at most once. For example, this is a typical polar plot, which is okay for us. But double crossing is not allowed. Okay, actually, these assumptions were not critical for Nike's stability analysis and Nike's plot. But when we move to stability margins, and especially when we move to border plots, these assumptions will be kind of critical, such that our maths or our like algorithms or computation styles will work for closed-up systems. If you violate these assumptions, you can still talk about stability margins or other kind of metrics, but the content will be deeper and a little bit more complicated. So for this semester, just keep in mind that we stick these assumptions in our analysis of control systems. Okay, now let's talk about stability. Uh, okay. So assumptions, and we can use gain and phase margins from the polar plot, okay? But, so let's draw a nice plot here. This is first next plot, okay, let's complete it, okay? So this is nice, as you can see, this is a typical max plot. And let's draw another one here, okay, okay. And let's assume that these two systems are stable. And what does it mean? We know that in order for these systems to be stable, the minus one should be here, right? Minus one, 
a minus one. So we have an infinite dimensional. Let's assume that goes up here. Okay. So if minus one is not circulated or covered by the boundaries of the next plot, both of systems are stable. Okay, no problem with that. Okay. So the idea is we want to be away from the minus one. Okay. In that sense, we can maybe develop some relative stability metrics. Okay, you want to be away from the minus one. So for example, we can try to look at the point. Let's look at here. That is closest to the origin or minus one. Let's assume that it is here. Okay. And if we look at this distance, okay, then maybe this can be a good stability margin for our system. So it's a technically complex number here. So we can look at the complex uh, absolute distance and it can be a good margin. Actually, it's a good margin. Okay. So in some of the textbooks, they talk, talk about this, but the problem is this point, first of all, it's hard to compute even if you have analytical tools, right? Okay. So this is the first reason. Even for graphically or analytically computation of this distance is hard. Second thing is we will move from polar plot to border plot in that case, there is no like good way of uh, estimating or finding this uh, distance. For this reason, what we do is we simply okay. So let's change this. Don't use this, but we somehow use two different metrics which kind of approximate this distance. Okay, and I will talk about this. Oh, game match. Okay. So what's gain margins? So uh, I have two definitions, one in my lecture notes, one in here. Let me uh, express this uh, to you. The change in opponent gain required to reach the Nyquist stable limit. Okay, so let's assume that we have an experiment and this is a tunable parameter. Okay, this is kappa. Normally it's equal to one, which is designed to close the system, but we kind of change it a little bit. Let's assume that the system is stable and we know that if it is stable, let's look at this and we can complete the whole other thing. Okay, minus one here. If we increase kappa, we know that we will scale the polar plot. And at some point, it will cross. Let's change the color. Okay, it will cross. The polar plot will cross minus one. Okay. And the gain, the kappa, that causes this is our gain margin for a stable system. And as you know, kappa is larger than one for stable systems. Okay, so how we can compute kappa? Actually, it is super easy. We don't need to test all of the kappas because we know this point, right? What's this point? This is the point where the Nyquist plot or polar plot crosses the negative real axis. Let's assume that this is equal to minus sigma p. Sigma p is element of real plus. So what is gain margin? Gain margin is simply equal to one over sigma p. Okay. So from the power plot, if you already computed this point, computation of the gain margin is very easy. For this, for a stable system or for this system, as you know, gain margin is larger than one, which means that the system is stable. Let's show an, another one. Uh, an unstable system, and let's uh, recompute the gain margin and see what happens. Okay, this is the power plot, and minus one here. This is equal to minus sigma p. If I compute gain margin, it is equal to we know sigma p, but, but since sigma p is larger than one, we know that gain margin is less than one, which means that the system is indeed unstable. Okay, so in this sense, instead of by drawing all of the Nyquist plot and looking at the circulation, you can look at the gain margin, and if it's negative, it means that your system is unstable. Okay, so gain margin, both uh, larger than one and smaller than one, gives information about your relative stability. If a stable system in this case, it is relative stability, and in this case, it's relative unstability. How close you are to unstable region, or how close you are going to the stable region. Okay, this is the gain margin. And let's move on to the other margin, phase margin. Okay, the definition of phase margin is this. The amount of phase lag required to reach the Nyquist stability limit. In general, understanding gain margin is easier for many uh, students 
Phase margin can be a little bit tricky, but let's assume that we have a system, fictitious system, such that we can add phase lag to the system. Actually, for example, transport delay, a pure delay, don't change the magnitude of your system in terms of frequency response, but it produces a phase lag. Okay. At some point, if your system reaches next of the limit, that specific phase is your phase margin. Okay. So how we compute it graphically, understanding I, it's relatively easy. Okay. So let's assume that we have an X plot. This is minus one. And let's assume that it is something like this. It goes closed. Okay. So we know how to compute the game margin. But the idea in the phase margin is it don't change the magnitude, even the shape of the Nike, no, it changed shape, so magnitude of the Nike plot, but it changes phase. Okay, so from this perspective, when we reach Nike stability limit, when our polar plot crosses minus one, right? At this point, we reach the Nike stability limit, and after that, we become unstable. So when or which point is critical for phase margin is simple. What we do is we draw a unit circle. Okay. Let's assume that. Very good. We draw a unit circle. Okay. So what happens is phase margin adds a phase lag. And let's look at this point crossing of the polar plot with the unit circle. When we add phase lag, it pushes my point in this direction. Okay, right in this direction, and if let's assume that this is phi critical, if this phi is equal to phi critical, what happens is this point will meet at the origin, it will go to here, and this system will become unstable. So, what phase margin is very simple. Let's draw a clean one. So, what you do, you draw a polar plot, okay. Then you uh, draw a unit circle. Okay. You look at the crossing. It has a complex number. You look at the angle from with respect to negative real axis. And let's change the color. This angle is basically my phase margin. Okay. So if your phase margin ends up being positive, which is good, this is uh, sorry for S. This system is stable. If phase margin ends up being negative, so if your point somewhere here, then your system is unstable. Okay, this is how we can compute the phase margin from the graphical representation. Okay, so we are done with the graphical representation of the phase margin and graphical representation game margin. Let's uh, try to uh, summarize what we can do and else, because this is like if you're a polar plot, you can do that, but we are not quite useless uh, if you don't have a polar plot. So let's look at the phase margin. So I say that, look at the crossing of the polar plot with the unit circle. Let's assume that it is something like this. So in this case, it means that there exists a specific frequency such that the magnitude of my polar plot is equal to 1. And this frequency is called gain cross over frequency. Okay. So if you find this frequency, and sometimes there will be a couple of them, I will talk about that later. Let's assume that we have on 1. You look at the phase j omega g. Once you compute it, phase margin is very simple. Phase margin is equal to, let's maybe look at your lecture notes, pi or 180 degrees plus phase of g o o j omega g. As you can see, it's very easy. Okay, it has a phase and it generally has a negative phase. You add pi, and technically this gives me the this angle, phase margin. Okay, if phase margin is larger than zero, the system is stable and higher the phase margin is, more robust or more stable your system is. So it is a relative stability metric. Okay, now let's go back to game margin. Let's do the same thing with the game margin. In the game margin, we simply look at the point where we cross the negative real axis. Okay, so actually in this point, what happens is my phase, g of omega p, is equal to 
180 degrees, or minus, plus minus 180 degrees, or plus minus pi, right? Because uh, negative real axis. And if I know this frequency, my gain margin is simply equal to 1 over g of j omega p. Okay, this is my gain margin. Okay, even if you don't have the polar plot, you can easily compute gain and phase margin, but your polar plot will help you to understand what kind of phase margin gain margin you have is it going to be larger than one smaller than one the phase margin is good or bad graphics are also helping us us but if you want an exact gain margin or phase margin it's better to use the formulas okay so let's show an example to understand phase and gain margin okay this is now this this is an example and the goal is computing phase and gain margin for this closed loop system okay so we already computed the uh, Nyquist plot for this system and the polar plot. Let's look at this. Okay, so where this Nyquist plot crosses the negative real axis, indeed it never, or let's say zero. So sigma p is equal to zero, right? It's just crossing. So in this case, gain margin is equal to one over zero. It is infinity. So does it make sense? Yes, because we know that if, as we increase k. The gain of the open loop system, open loop gain of the system, it will scale the system with respect to the origin. So, for example, let's k is equal to 2, I will obtain a circle which has the radius of 2 but centered around 1. But as you can see, no matter what happens to my k, it will always be stable as far as k is larger than 0. Positive. Okay, so for this system, gain margin equal to infinity let's look at the phase margin but for that let's draw a unit circle which technically crosses minus one and one okay so let's look at the point where my Nyquist plot crosses them uh, or polar plot crosses the unit circle is this right it only crossing when omega is equal to zero so gain crossover frequency is equal to zero radian per second and what is the phase here zero so my phase margin is equal to pi plus zero, so it is pi. So if you look at graphically, I have two like vectors. One is this, and the other one is this. Okay, so for that, so okay. So what is the angle between these two vectors is, as you can see, 180 degrees. So the, for this system, phase margin is equal to 180 degrees, which kind of finalizes that. This system has a very good gain margin. Infinity, it's perfect, actually. And very good phase margin. And 180 phase margin is remarkably good for closed loop systems. Okay, so let's show a different example. If we can do that. Okay, so in this case, we have a second order system, but we have a tunable gain. And the goal is computing phase and gain margin for k is equal to 2 and k is equal to 4. Okay, so, so what are we going to do? Yes, first we will uh, draw the next plot for k is equal to 1. Okay, you know that because we already computed in previous lectures. Okay, let's clean k is equal to 1. And what happens when k is equal to 2? We simply change the numbers, right? So this is 2. And we know that this will be 2. This will be minus j. This will be j. Okay. And minus 1 is somewhere here. Okay. So what is gain margin? Very simple. Where my night plot or polar plot crossing the negative real axis? Zero. So gain margin is equal to one over zero. It is infinite. It's perfect. It is a perfect gain margin. Okay. It means that I can increase my k under infinity. My system will be still stable, which is correct. Okay. What about phase margin? We need to draw a unit circle. Okay. So actually, for this example, we don't need to draw a unit circle because we know that uh, for this system, magnitude of g of omega is monotonically decreasing as omega is decreasing, right? Okay, and let's look at this point. At this point, magnitude of g of j omega is equal to 1, right? g of j omega is equal to 1. It's great. So we already computed it. So for this reason, what we are going to do is look at the angle between this vector and negative real axis, as you can see, it is 90 degrees. So phase margin for the system is equal to 90 degrees. So infinite gain margin, 
19 degree phase margin, which is pretty good for the system. Okay, so what is next? Changing k is equal to 2. Okay, so uh, no, not 2. I think, let's remember, it will be 4. Okay, great. So let's clean that. Let's change this. So it will be 4. This is 4. This is minus 2j here. 2j minus 1 is somewhere here. Okay, so game margin is not changed. As you can see, game margin is still infinity. But phase margin is changed because since uh, this distance equal to 2, unit circle will be somewhere here. Okay, so I need to look at this point, which is a vector, and I need to look at this angle. I think this is phase margin is approximately maybe like 40, 60 degrees. Okay, as you can see, computation of the phase margin from the graphical plot is slightly harder than the game margin because we don't know exactly where my polar plot crosses the uh, unit circle, right? Especially if you draw by hand. Okay, in these cases, what we do is we use the formula for an exact computation. Okay, let's do that together. Okay, let me look at main computations, which is good. Okay, so k is equal to 4. Okay, let's clean everything. We already know the phase margin. You look at k. So, what are we going to do? Let's remember. First, we need to look at the magnitude, right? And we will equate it to 1. So, if we look at the magnitude, what's, uh, what's our transfer function? It is this. Uh, what is the magnitude? So, magnitude is equal to magnitude of 1 over j plus 1 square, right? Okay. It is equal to 1 divided by what is the magnitude? Is You can see it is omega square plus 1. Yes, omega square plus 1. Okay, so it's very easy. But of course, the k is 4, so this will be 4. This will be 4, not 4. Okay, so it's kind of hard. This is 4. This is where it's no matter. Okay, so my magnitude is equal to 4 over omega cross 1. Okay, so at a specific frequency, the uh, gain transfer frequency, this is equal to 1. This is the frequency of this point. Okay, so like that. Okay, so how we computed it? In this case, ome omega g, sorry for that, omega g cross 1 is equal to 4. Omega g square is equal to 3. Omega g is equal to square root of 3 radian per second. So we computed omega g. So what are we going to do is we need to compute the phase of the system. Okay, so let's compute the phase. g of j omega g, it is equal to phase of 4 divided by j 3, no, j omega plus 1, right, square. So the phase of 4 is 1, so this is equal to minus 2, phase of j omega plus 1. This is equal to minus 2, what is omega? j square root of 3 plus 1. So this is, the phase is equal to, if you look at computations, actually it is minus 2 times 60 degrees, so it is equal to minus 100 20 degrees. It's great. So we computed the phase. What is phase margin? Phase margin is equal to minus 180 degrees, no plus, plus the phase here, which is minus 120 degrees. So my phase margin for the system is simply equal to 60 degrees, which is kind of close to our expectations, right? We expect it to be uh, between, where's that? Uh, 40 and 60 degrees. Okay, let's look at fine-tuned uh, like, uh, plots. As you can see, uh, these are from uh, obtained from MATLAB. This is my first system. Phase margin is 90 degrees. It's obvious. Game margin is infinite for both cases. And here, this angle indeed is equal to 60 degrees as we computed previously. Okay, so this is 60 degrees. Okay, it's fine. Okay, so, so we have two systems and two gates. So for one system, two gates. K is equal to two, K is equal to four. When I increase gain, what happens is, Game margin is no change if I increase k. But what happened is phase margin is decreased. I 
if I in increase K. Okay, so there is a drop in face mark. Okay, now you can like uh, wonder what happens in terms of close performance when I decrease or increase the K mark. Okay, let's look at an example. So what is the global transfer function? It is equal to, uh, let's remember our system. What was that? One uh, S plus one squared. Okay, so my closer transfer function is K S plus one squared divided by one plus K S plus one squared. Okay, so if I look at that, so for K is equal to two, my closer transfer function will be two S squared plus two S plus three. For K is equal to four, T will be equal to four s squared plus 2s plus 5. Okay, so as you can see, I changed the poles. If I compute the damping ratio for both cases, first one is equal to 1 over square root of 3, and second one is 1 over square root of 5. So what happens? If I increase k, I decrease the phase margin, and as you can see, my damping is decreased. And this is a uh, complex conjugate pole system. When I decrease the damping, my overshoot is increased. So in that sense, we can conclude that a decrease in phase margin can result in an increase in the overshoot. And if it is correct, there is a, well, a very close relationship between the phase margin and overshoot of the system. If you want small overshoot, okay, you need to increase your phase margin as much as possible. Okay? So for this reason, as you can see, this relative stability metric is directly related with the closed performance of the system. Okay, this is one way of designing your controllers using frequency domain techniques. Okay, so let's solve a different example. Now the goal is computing gain and phase margin for uh, k is equal to 1 and k is equal to 8. And this is my system. Okay, let's remember the next plot. Okay, this is the next plot with respect to k. Okay. So let's compute the gain margin first of all for both cases. Gain margin is equal to what? 1 over k divided by 8. It is equal to 8 over k. Okay. When k is equal to 1, my gain margin is equal to what? 8. Okay, which is good. When k is equal to 8, what is my gain margin? It is equal to 1. So what is 1? It's not greater than 1, it's not less than 1. It means that when k is equal to 8, as you can see, this becomes minus 1, and my Nyquist or polar plot is exactly on the minus 1 path, or minus 1 is exactly on my Nyquist plot. So we reached or touched the Nyquist stable limit. So this is stable, this is critically stable, and we know that critical stable systems are viable and stable. Okay, as you can see, one system is stable, it has a positive gain margin, the other one is unstable. Okay, now let's try to look at the phases and try to understand what happens to my system. Okay, so first of all, let's uh, look at the case, uh, the way I want. Okay, so uh, when k is equal to 1, this will be equal to 1, and we know that for this system, g of j omega is monotonically decreasing as omega is increasing, so which means that when k is equal to 1, this system will touch unit circle only at omega is equal to 0. So what is the phase margin? Phase margin is simply is equal to 180 degrees. This system will be very robust and stable for this case. Okay. When k is equal to 8, let's clean again. What happens? Okay, let's clean this. Delete. Okay. Okay, when k is equal to 8, we know that this will be 8, this will be minus 1. If we draw the unit circle, unit circle will obviously will cross the minus 1. Okay, so this is the point, and what is phase margin? Phase margin is simply equal to 0 because my phase is 180 degrees. 80 degrees. And if you look at the computation, 180 degrees plus minus 180 degrees is equal to 0. So my phase margin is equal to 0. And this is the final result. As you can see, k is equal to 1, k is equal to 8. So in this case, gain margin is 8, phase margin is 180 degrees. Gain margin is equal to 1, 
phase margin is equal to zero, which means that we are on the Nyquist stability limit. Both gain margin and phase margin stating that. So one gain margin and zero phase margin means that the system is now critically stable. 